Okay, well, we're going to get started. Uh, it, could somebody in the back please close that door, please, so we have more quiet? Thank you. I am working to get my one slide up so that I can have the names of the panelists in front of you here. Um, today we're going to have a, uh, a panel on European legal entities for free software projects. Um, a lot has been happening in this space and particularly in this past year and so what we'd like to do is give you an opportunity to meet some new organizations and hear from them. Uh, what I propose we do is um, give each panelist uh, just a, a five minute introduction or a brief introduction to their organization. I'll ask one or two questions and then um, we'll open it up uh, to the audience for questions. Oh, well, finally I have my uh, my uh, slide with the names on it. In fact, is this the one that, there. I don't know if that, is that too dark? If I do, okay, well let's, that way you can at least see things. First of all, Simon Phipps. Why, thank you, Tom. Quick. So, hello, good afternoon, and welcome from all of us. Um, <laughs> So I'm up first because I managed to get to the f the starting line first uh, out of the, the, the three of the, this end of the, uh, the panel here. Over the last few years, it's become increasingly obvious that it's important to have organizations who will look after the administrative and uh, legal duties of growing communities of uh, free and open source software. And so we've seen a, a growth of demand from organizations that do this, organizations like the Software Freedom Conservancy, organizations like Apache Fit Software Foundation. And uh, there seems to be an infinite amount of demand. Uh, and uh, I s realized about two years ago that all of the organizations that did general purpose fiduciary hosting were based in America. And uh, as somebody who's also involved in digital civil liberties, that alarmed me uh, because I felt that I don't necessarily want all of the assets of projects I'm working on to be under US law because you never know what might happen in the United States. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Um, so, <laughs> or, 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 I was going to make a comment about Brexit, but I just... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, I'm, coming on, I'm coming on to that. Um, so, uh, I, I started throwing the idea around talking about there being a Euro European fiduciary host. Now, by fiduciary, fiduciary is an English word that means to do with good faith. And so fiduciary hosting means looking after all the things that are done in good faith to uh, meet legal and good governance requirements. And um, so I started thinking about how one would create a fiduciary host in the UK. I did some research. I found out in the UK about a thing called a community interest company, which is a not-for-profit but not charity organization. And I decided I would start a fiduciary umbrella in the UK to serve Europe. Um, uh, at the same time as I was doing this, uh, Moritz was doing the same thing, and Mikiel was doing the same thing, and we hadn't bothered, we all know each other, we'd forgotten to mention it to each other. And so we've all three gone ahead and created organizations. Um, they, are, they are quite different from each other in character. So, Public software uh, is a, a, a term that uh, I, I didn't actually coin it. I've not found out who coined the term public software. Public software is a term to avoid the need to decide whether you're going to say open source or free software. Uh, and it means uh, software that has got the software freedom included inside it. And um, so software freedom uh, is the, the baseline of what public software does. Uh, we are a community interest company. That means that we are able to engage in trading and commercial activity, but we are not allowed to use the proceeds of that commercial activity for anything other than the service of the public community we've declared we will serve. And the public community we've declared we will serve is those people who are the users and creators of public software. And so we, we have the same constraints on us as would be on a charity, 
but uh, we don't have the ability to recover tax benefits. And uh, that's probably the largest difference between us and, and, and everybody else. Uh, I, I don't really believe that matters, because I've tried making donations across Europe to other organizations, and the cost of recovering the tax, getting the tax benefit, is, has always been larger than the tax benefit. Uh, because the process that you have to engage in is always a heavy bureaucratic process. So while in Europe we do have an environment where theoretically you can make tax deductible donations across <laughs> borders, in reality for most country pairs that is not practical. And because of that I, I believe that the, 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 the recovery of tax benefit is a very marginal benefit for an organization providing fiduciary hosting in Europe. Now, when larger sums of money are involved, such as the ones that, that uh, Moritz is working with, I think there is a case to be made about getting tax-deductible donations. So public software started in uh, February last year. Uh, we have one project working with us now, a project called Travel Spirit. Travel Spirit is a community, a quite diverse community of uh, individuals and companies working on mobility as a service software. Uh, that's the idea of creating open source frameworks for running things like Uber uh, at a city level, probably through a public transit authority rather than through a predatory private corporation. And uh, so that project is going fairly well. It's been going for, for nearly a year now and is doing, doing okay. So public software, now we're based in the UK, and I, I hadn't in anticipated there would be any problem with being based in the UK for <laughs> a, a European organization. And, and then, you know, you know how bad things can happen to countries sometimes. Well, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, we have very, very gentlemanly and, and refined fascists in the UK, and they've, ma <laughs> they've managed to persuade the country to vote to, uh, to um, be unfriendly to the rest of Europe. And so that complicates public software, and our queue of people wanting to join has become uh, much, much, uh, much reduced, we've discovered. Uh, and that's all very much to the advantage of the, uh, the gentleman over to my right. Uh, who was next? I think you were next, weren't you, Lawrence, time-wise? Well, oh, I'll make you next, so. oh, you're yeah. next. <clears throat> so, uh, Michael, I was next. Oh, you were next. So am I audible? So uh, I come from, uh, uh, Simon is, is a well-known open source uh, 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 v, v, VIP. Uh, I come from, a, from a, a far lesser known region. I work for a small charity called Enelnet Foundation. We, uh, 20 years ago, in, uh, uh, actually 30 years ago, uh, Enelnet sort of came into life by a group of Unix engineers that announced the EU net, and Enelnet was a Dutch part of that. It grew, it grew, it grew. Ten years later, uh, 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 or seven years later, that became a separate foundation. It was, a, it was sort of a network for, for that, that, a grassroots network across Europe that grew into basically European internet. In 1997, everything was sold, and all the money went into a trust fund. And that's where, it, that's where the story starts, because we started giving out money to all these projects, hundreds of projects that are doing all kinds of cool open source stuff. Uh, and over the years, we just watched people suffer and suffer. And we met many people that wanted to do stuff about it. We saw, I mean, we, we worked with, with many people in the field. And um, as time grew, we, we, we wanted to find a solution to the problem that when you get a bunch of really good engineers and they, uh, uh, they create something cool and then uh, they become so successful that you send them to lawyers. And that is just a very painful thing for them to live through. And then you give them money, and they have to, to get a community, uh, to build a community. By the way, it's interesting is that um, we're programmed against the community track. I, I think I feel more at home in the community track than in the legal track, uh, because I'm not a lawyer. But I, this is for us, is, this is how, how do we build communities? And so the idea was, let's take the whole burden out of, the whole pressure out of getting organized. Because uh, we are, as an element, we are a charity. We can receive money, we can pay money. There's a, a huge tax benefit to being paid by a charity, at least in some countries. There's no income tax on that, so you get uh, a, a pretty nice, in some countries, half of your wages sort of become tax-free. That, that is a pretty attractive uh, benefit. Um, but as a charity, we, we're 
uh, a professional manager of funds. People can give us money and we can professionally manage those. There's oversight. And we've seen so many small foundations where a couple of willing people are, are, are able to do this, sustain this for a couple of years. But the 75 years of copyright after the death of the last remaining code author is nowhere near to be seen in any of the foundations that we see. So we thought, why don't we create a vehicle to end all vehicles? So we, we named our project, or our, our, our uh, uh, funny name is a Hypervisor for Free Software Foundations. So what we, uh, uh, what we do is we, we give people sort of their own environment, but instead of putting the money uh, into that environment, we ask people to just, just like a squirrel, put out the nuts everywhere they can. For instance, at the Nelnet Foundation or any other place. Uh, and all that we do are legal uh, 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 Dropbox in, in a way. <coughs> people can put their code and their copyrights and their assets in a safe place, knowing that it is community governed and that it will always be that way. So it's a, um, there's a zero, uh, um, uh, uh, we, we, don't, we cannot make profits because we actually promise to not have a single euro ever in our foundation. So we, we are completely separate, ethereal, only intangible assets and our dream is to completely automate things so that people can just put sta safe stuff uh, uh, in, inside our foundation, have programs that manage these so that the, the virtual organizations can exist and there's a mechanism for people to sort of decide on, 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 on creating yet another license on top of their code or uh, uh, changing names or, or, or forking or whatever. Um, but there's no reason for them to, uh, to, to go to uh, and, and spend a lot of money, do, do three monthly tax uh, payments. Uh, even though there's no money inside, you still have to file these things. So basically, our idea is to simplify and, and, and automate it. And we've, we've, we've gone for a very promiscuous model where we don't uh, in, impose stuff because anybody, it's just like getting children. Anybody can get a child and anybody can start a foundation. They can bloody well do what they want. So we're not going to sit on anybody's chair and make them do anything. We will just hand them best practices, what we feel are best practices. And they can sort of ask us for rational, sane templates of doing things. And those are then, uh, just like virtual machines, you can create virtual organizations, uh, any, any shape, flavor, model that you want. Um, yeah, I think that's enough for now, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the real need maybe later. Okay. Moritz. <coughs> um, hello, I'm, I'm Moritz. Um, I was active in the kind of free software space, mostly in the internet, what's the so-called internet freedom space. Uh, and in 2013, I joined a foundation called the Renewable Freedom Foundation. It's a charity in Germany. And the mission of the Renewable Freedom Foundation is to, st to strengthen and defend civil liberties in, in the digital space. <laughs> so uh, I began in 2013 together with uh, people at the foundation to come up with a concept of what the foundation would actually be doing. It was set up in 2012 by a Bavarian newspaper publisher. So he set aside some of the money that he's been making uh, we are not uh, officially affiliated with the newspaper. We are sort of affiliated with the founder, the current uh, publisher, the, the, the publisher of that newspaper. Um, and uh, in 2014, I took uh, the guy who was back then running the foundation to uh, roughly 40 events uh, to introduce him to many projects, different communities uh, in, in the space of open data, new journalism, kind of uh, uh, whistleblowing, um, and of course the whole space of technology that I was familiar with. And over time, we, the foundation is, it was meant to give out uh, funds, so quite similar to an LNET, but on a smaller scale. Um, and we, we kind of positioned ourselves as an intermediary. So what I noticed very quickly that there's a lot of funding potentially flooding into the internet freedom space and that it can be quite damaging. If you, don't, if you don't handle it the right way, if you're naive and you take that money, you're going to end up with a broken project and a broken community. Um, so my, my stance always was that we have to address this. We've, a lot of people and a lot of projects that I, I talk to 
they want money, they want to grow and think that money can be an enabler for that. Uh, I am very skeptical about, about money in the space of, of these, these very enthusiasm-driven uh, efforts in, 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 in the human rights space. Uh, but of course, I, I, it, there's a valid point in saying that you have to have something to eat. You have to have, have some kind of uh, stability in your life that you can, you can continue doing what you, what you want to do. Uh, so in uh, being a funder, you can interact with other fun foundations that do grants. And I help people write their grant applications and I was able to kind of explore the space of potential funders that fund with a human rights angle. So I participate in a lot of human rights uh, uh, um, uh, conferences uh, where the digital does not play a big role, uh, not as big as it will become in that space because of all the stuff that is happening there with targeted malware attacks against activists, journalists, surveillance, and, and all these, these topics. And I build bridges between a lot of different communities. And um, so most of what I do is just listen to where the people are, what their problems are, and, and to see who I can point them to or how I can help them with their current uh, uh, efforts. And at the same time, since we've been handing out a bit of money, uh, it's, um, uh, I, I, that the, the problem is, for, 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 that, for that problem when you, when you have money, is how to, how to make sure the team understands how they will do things. Sometimes it's very organically that the founder of a project will start a foundation or some legal entity or, or he already has a for-profit that, that he starts using. And there's never the point where you make very conscious decisions about who is in control of the assets of the projects and who is in control of like the financial assets. And, uh, I think the, the major benefit that I see for, for, a, for a fiduciary sponsor is that the, the moment you, you join a fiduciary sponsor, there's certain things where you, have, you, have, you should make clear agreements. And this is the point of, of realization within the community of, around the project of what their needs are and how to protect those, uh, th those needs and, and the communities. Uh, and that led me to... I can host some things at the foundation, but it's not that straightforward. So we have been hosting a couple of bank accounts for some projects to hold some of the funding. And in March, we started um, um, creating, like developing this, uh, the Center for the Cultivation of Technology. Uh, we registered it in October. So it's a really recent uh, development. Um, we, we are now organizationally ready in the kind of in the legal sense to be active. Uh, our legal form is we are based in Germany with the company. The company is fully owned by the foundation, which is a charity, but the company itself is also a charity. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a limited liability company. It's a GmbH in Germany uh, with the charity status. So it's a gemeinnützige GmbH. Um, uh, it can do for-profit activities, so when projects uh, want to engage in minor for-profit activities, uh, that's possible. Um, and I'm mostly focusing on, on projects in a stage where the, they, they've, they've been successful, they, they are around, they have, they have a sort of community, maybe the community of one developer uh, that is fairly common. and. Uh, they need a legal entity for some specific thing, um, like uh, a grant that is being offered, uh, or people coming, they want to donate, they want to contribute 10 euros. The project is not going to actually benefit from the 10 euros that much. But if there's some bank account somewhere where there's little complexity, they can fill it up and use it for hackathons or for a bit of travel. Uh, so very light involvement. And on the other hand, all the projects in the internet freedom space where there is this ngo -lization. There is this movement to uh, getting funding. Um, and actually, the first project that uh, uh, I, I didn't even like had on a, on a, on a mental map, um, uh, we're, we're now, the first project that we're taking on uh, is a European Commission-funded consortium. And we are one of the partner organizations in that consortium. And I think that's a very good example because they, they expect 
to be a, a limited liability company. They want usually consortia to exist of like university partners and some um, for profits and the traditional for profits that are part of these research, research efforts uh, usually uh, 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 file patents uh, do do some proprietary stuff that never sees the light of day because it's just to get the money out of the European Commission uh, funding flow um, and um, we fill the need there because we can add we can we, we will be responsible for a work package that integrates the research into open source and into an existing open source uh, application. Um, so my focus, I think we're very much complementary. I think it's perfect that you exist and you 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 well, try. Let's, well, let's talk about comparisons yes. afterwards yes. after everyone's had just, a chance to just, give an introduction. Uh, just one, one last point is that we, we want to get the financial stuff right. We want to make it easy that people can see how much money they have in their accounts, do some budgeting, bookkeeping, uh, make it very easy to interface, give us receipts, and uh, invent something that is scalable across many projects and that can be used in very, various different entities to handle the management of, of, of 50 projects or whatever. Uh, in, in a non-profit environment. So that's our focus and we need the work that Michiel is doing at the Commons Conservancy because he's de detailing out all the decisions that the projects have to make before they reach the point where they can come to us and say, okay, give us a bank account. Okay, I, I, I think I'm going to troll this panel a little yes. bit. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Well, okay. So in some way, so hi, I'm Karen Sandler. I'm the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy. Um, in some ways, we are uh, the oldest and newest organization on this panel because uh, we are a U.S.-based organization in being the Software Freedom Conservancy, but we're also ramping up a conservancy France. Um, so uh, Software Freedom Conservancy uh, as a uh, as the U.S. organization has been around for a while uh, and has been active in Europe and the U.K. for uh, uh, quite quite a while, um, and uh, you know we've held assets in Europe and done quite a number of things in Europe. And of course, the participants of our um, of our projects are global. Um, and I totally agree with what's been said before that there's so much room for a lot of different organizations. Um, but I think my biggest troll of this panel is to say that I'm so glad that we've made it look so exciting and fun that <laughs> everybody else wants to do it too. Um, but uh, so, uh, uh, and I would say that, uh, that, uh, that these problems are hard. And many of the, the, the things that, uh, that you're hearing are true of our organization too. We, um, we have, are the home of over 40 free and open source software projects, including uh, Git, Samba, Wine, Inkscape, Selenium, PHP, My Admin. Um, uh, the list, list goes on. Uh, Bro Network Security Monitor. I, uh, I'm always told by my colleague Bradley that I should not try to list them because then I'll just keep keep going, um, and it's hard to choose. Uh, we're also the home of Outreachy, which is a diversity program for uh, women and other underrepresented people in free and open source software, and participants are global. There was one round. We do about uh, like uh, 90 interns per year who come through our program, um, and there was uh, at least one round where there was one intern from each habitable continent, um, so a, a truly global program. Uh, and uh, and we also are known for being the uh, one of our member projects is the uh, uh, coalition of kernel developers that ask us to enforce their copyrights and we have funded the lawsuit of Krista Helwig uh, in Germany against VMware. Uh, so uh, so as you can see, we are uh, active uh, uh, globally, and uh, uh, the way it works with conservancy is that. When a project applies to Conservancy, they become a part of our organization. Uh, we are their nonprofit identity. They are analogous to a uh, like a division of a corporation. And part of that onboarding process and coming is uh, is some of the like virtualization ideas of organization. So when organizations, when free software projects and communities join us, um, we help them figure out how their governance exists. And instead of having to form their own organization, they kind of, they, they form a, also a virtual organization within us, where they don't need uh, to file a, a, a particular form of, 
of organization with three members on the board or whatever the, the particular laws are. And instead, they can run the project with however it works for them. And within our member projects, that's totally different from project to project. Some projects have uh, big communities where they run elections. And uh, some of our projects just have a, a, a small committee of five people who or three people who, who always make their decisions by consensus. And we basically can tailor it project by project. So that's really, really handy. Um, we also, uh, uh, I guess the bad news for everybody here, and I think everybody here already knows it, is that this is really tough work and, uh, and not uh, very, uh, I hate using the word sexy, but uh, I'm not. <laughs> uh, glamorous. It's, it's not glamorous at all, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard work, it's thankless work, and, um, and it's very hard to fund. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we have a match donation now. And so if you donate to Conservancy just for this week, it's matched. So it counts two times. I'm so sorry. Uh, but uh, 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 we need to fundraise from the public in order to subsidize the work that we do for our projects. Um, but we take in money in a number of different ways from sources all over the world. So we have some grant funding that we take in individual donations um, also around the world. Uh, we're looking at ramping up uh, Conservancy France because uh, there's some flexibility for handling. Ass there's not a lot of things that uh, that we found that uh, that we wanted to do that we couldn't do with our own organization, but we just have th a few things that will be a little bit easier. Um, one of the main things that we're doing is uh, is creating a system for tracking uh, assets and accounting that uh, that will create a free and open source software solution that everyone can use. And this is a challenge that uh, that a lot of free and open source software organizations have experienced in this space. Um, that it's just it's the mass of transactions is just huge. Like because one of the things that free software projects want to use. This, these entities for are sending people to conferences. And each person that goes to a conference has all these receipts. And they have receipts for their flight and receipts for their hotel. You have to track each one. And you have to make sure that everything is, is handled properly, not just for whatever rules you might have to follow depending on your jurisdiction, but also to make sure that we have decent governance, transparency, and make sure that the funds are being used properly. So it's just in incredibly hard work. And we've been. Um, uh, focusing our entire operations around making this in a solvable way that is transportable for everyone. Well, well that actually leads into my, oh, okay. my, my, my question for the panel. I decided I'm only going to ask one question and then I'll we'll open it up to the audience just because you know the time is, is getting kind of short. So I'll just ask uh, each of the panelists this question. What checks and balances do you have in place so that we can trust you with our assets, both tangible and intangible? In other words, how do we avoid repeating history of like, let's say, the Tox Foundation, XORG, or OpenOffice.org? Mm. That's, that's a kick to you. Yes, yes. Those are all very different disasters you mentioned there. <laughs> um, so uh, a public software, we, we are a, uh, a limited liability company. And we have to maintain accounts like any other limited liability company. Uh, and we additionally have to file an annual report with the Commissioner of uh, Community Interest Companies in the UK, where we demonstrate that we are uh, continuing to serve our declared community. Uh, on top of that, what uh, uh, we're also so we've got we have one project and it has quite a low transaction rate because it isn't generally sending people to conferences at the moment. So at the moment we have a public uh, a, an open ledger that anyone in the project can see. Um, and uh, that is uh, uh, available for all of the participants, not just the formal participants who signed the contract, but any of the project participants to look at. And they can see exactly what uh, assets we hold. We hold all their domain names and their trademarks for them, and they're in the register. And then we also hold all of their funds, and we identify all of the uh, deductions that have taken place from their funding. So, so that, is, that is all transparent. Uh, the, the, I would say that the, the, the main check is that transparency, and the main balance is the fact that we have a public duty which is inspected by the government. Okay. So uh, at NLNet, we, uh, we've been running sort of this same thing internally for about 20 years. So we've been, we give away money to people, and they ask for it, and they ask for it in small chunks. Uh, and so people have been sending us receipts uh, over and over again. And so this is something that we have. Uh, a, a, a person handling professionally all the time. 
uh, we uh, every decision that is made is 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 uh, uh, is made through a very specific <laughs> process where all the uh, the whole governance body is notified. So if somebody sends in a receipt, then uh, that would be a decision that everybody knows of. Uh, so uh, uh, and that's an internal that's an internal mailing list for each project. Wow! So what is the volume of that? It's we're just starting, and it, oh, it, we're, oh. we're we're not we're okay. not so we're not sending lots of people out on trips as well. So, but the the uh, uh, and it would be just be for the program for each program, right? So not for every program to receive all the traffic from other programs, but just from the the five people, three people working inside a, a project. So that it's just it's an open book. So uh, um, yeah, and uh, yeah, our our guarantee is that uh, when when we focus more on on the larger. Say you want to do some, uh, somebody has to build some re really boring testing infrastructure, and 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 he has to be working on this for six months, mm -hmm. and the community decides to pay up for that particular bit. They they apply for a grant with us, and then the whole process is handled like it would be a normal grant. So we do to do all the checks and balances for the project uh, to make sure that it's it's stable, and then the project is called saying this is what we've arranged with that person or that company or whatever so yeah we uh, first the, the professional management is is really important and the, as regards to the assets um, uh, basically everything that's donated to us uh, is, is sent through uh, uh, again to that to this decision mailing so incoming traffic is just uh, there's an oversight and there's a stack of things so that you can just always look at it's a right only mechanism all our legislation and so on it's, it's like a not a blockchain but a blockchain like idea where you can only tack on new versions of new things so yeah. i mean in the in the like simon said these cases that you mentioned had a lot of different circumstances and different reasons but i think uh there's uh things to say about transparency in many different angles as well, and I think the transparency is mostly something that the project should, the project community should decide what kind of a level of transparency they want uh, within a, a guiding framework that helps them to make useful, good decisions that avoid conflict in the future. And I think all these examples are uh, more a problem of, of bad governance models or bad adoption of, of, of structures within those communities rather than a, a, a question of transparency. Uh, in, 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 in these cases, cases that you mentioned, transparency wasn't the issue. Um, and I mean, we are a, a limited liability company in Germany. There's some filing, public filings that you have to do as a limited liability company. Uh, there's public filings in the sense of the of the charity status. So you have to file an annual report. And the, the difficulty we have is that the stuff will happen in German. Uh, the, the, the interactions with the government entities will happen in German. And we will make some effort to translate that. So an annual report will be published in English that is very near to the requirements of the German government. And I've been suggesting that we use the Formula 90 that is used in the US as a template of something that we don't file anywhere because we're not under the jurisdiction. Sure. Uh, but I think for anyone who is familiar with the 501c3s can then uh, look at, because basically the numbers and the, <coughs> the details and the narratives in the 990 are close to what we have to file anyway. So why not use the form and uh, produce something that is very similar to that? So that's, that's a, the, the minor thing about transparency in some sense. But I don't want to speak for the projects that uh, use us. Uh, for example, the European Commission funding, uh, there is SAP in the consortium. They have some non-disclosure stuff happening. They do some proprietary stuff that we're not even concerned about. Uh, so we will have to find the right balance there, cut out the stuff that... But that's kind of the decision in the consortium and the decision that we have to make as far... How far do we want to go? But we're not there yet. Um, so I cannot really comment much on that. I have to say that's so exciting that you're, uh, that I'm so surprised and excited to hear that you're thinking of using 990 as a template for uh, information elsewhere because we've been working on nonprofit accounting towards having just the accounting system generate the 990. Mm -hmm. So if that's useful in other places, that's even better. Like 
it's just that it, the, there's like simple manipulation of, of assets that you can you can script, and so it should be easy to make a form 990, not something that takes weeks and weeks. Yeah. So uh, so we're working towards that. Uh, for us, for trans for um, as far as uh, oversight and um, assurance that we're doing what we should be doing, we have multiple <coughs> levels of that. We have an evaluations committee that evaluates that uh, projects that come into conservancy are a good fit for conservancy and that uh, they meet our standards. Um, then. We we have an intake process where each project is helped with their governance. And uh, like Moritz was saying, uh, we tell her all of these things for the projects. They may decide to do different things, but they all have to meet a certain standard. And we have to be sure that there's not going to be uh, any undue influence by any one company or um, uh, or some other uh, kind of control that we wouldn't be comfortable with uh, in a in a free software project. Uh, we have a board of directors which oversees all of our work, and we have a charitable mission that we have to be accountable for. Uh, having an organization like one of ours participate with the free software project means that there's a kind of an outside party, which means that when there are uh, kind of like uh, inappropriate things suggested. People tend to be a little more sheepish. And uh, there's a third party that uh, that that uh, somebody can contact, a whistleblower can sort of say, hey, you should look into that transaction because I feel uncomfortable. And it's uh, it's no problem. And at the same time, when you have problems that happen in some of the examples that you mentioned where you have like a, we, we don't have to worry as much about not filing things or getting things in on time because we're doing it in a consolidated way. So all of that stuff seems to really help. Okay, well, that, that, that's really great. And, um, we have about five minutes for questions. So uh, does anyone from the audience have a question for the panel? <clears throat> well, hello, my name is Reinhard Mutz, and I'm the first elected president of World Privacy and Identity Association. I have a question to Moritz. We are located in Graz in Austria, and we just associated, and what we want to do is we want to set up a trusted service provider, which means that we will deploy certificates for free. Um, we found that we need three organizations to operate successfully. One is our association, one is an incorporated company, and the other one is a co cooperative. All three are owned by the, our association. And my question to you is, will you support us or can you support us to start? Uh, so the backstory in 2011, I started a nonprofit and that grew into a network of nonprofits, uh, which are 20 organizations in 14 countries. And that's how I became quite familiar with the different structures, the different nonprofit laws, different charity approaches. Uh, and that, uh, uh, unfortunately, that uh, uh, it spread that I knew about these things. So many people <laughs> have been coming to me since then to help them create the organizational structures, look into the bylaw stuff, and things like that. I think for the rest, we should take that offline. But for, like the, I think an important point here for me, for me, legal entities are tools. And they shouldn't become something. For me, you're creating an, a living organization, and it wants to eat, and it wants to grow. And any time you create a legal entity, you need to be careful to not turn it around that you become a tool of the legal entity, but that the tools stay within, uh, like, and, and to use them properly. So the tools that are available to me at the moment are like nonprofit associations, a company, a foundation, and things like that. So I, I, I generate more flexibility uh, to help uh, others. So happy to take this offline. Can I add uh, one more one more thing on the previous question, which which you you sort of when you said that you can, you need to make sure that the organization is the is the tool. Uh, one of the things that Conservancy does on that front is that we have very strong termination provisions, so our projects can leave easily. Yes. And we've helped many of our projects leave either to form their own organization or to do something else. Um, and I think that that's a, a really important part of transparency, but it's a really important pi part of finding the right governance structure. <laughs> Uh, to, to add on that is, is not just leaving, it's also splitting apart because I think there's a, a gilded cage where you're in, where you're in a foundation, there's some money there, there's some assets there, and the guy that leaves is the guy that has nothing or the girl that leaves. So uh, people tend to fight over assets and we've, we've designed, we've went out of our way, spent a lot of time in designing procedures to basically also fork an organization so that you can par just have separate ways so that each and everyone can just continue to do what they're good at rather than to fight for <coughs> either all or nothing. Okay. 
Um, so it was a it was a comment that Mikhail made about people who sign, which leads to this question, which is, to me, I'm always sort of intrigued by the the ambiguous nature. We, we talk so loosely about projects, but in reality, there are people. And so how do you decide, how do you identify who has authority to speak for the project? And I, I think, Karen, when you say governance, like eventually you, you <laughs> force them to that point, but sort of how do you manage even are the people I'm talking to the right people, and is there somebody else who should be included in this conversation? And what kind of what kind of legal commitments, or what kind, who can make the commitment, and what kind of commitments can they make? So for us, we've put this into lists. So everything is handled by a list. So the, uh, at, at intake, we have a quartermaster that appoints somebody, uh, appoints a group of people to be the uh, the governing body, and whatever they call it, it doesn't matter. But it's a mailing list, and we only accept messages that are CC to the mailing list. So when there's a contest within, uh, we recommend 48 hours, but it can be longer. If there's a contest of any decision that goes over that list, uh, uh, it's, it, it, it becomes uh, 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 something that has to be redone. If there's no contest, we can, we can take action. Um, so when organizations join public software, they, they sign a, a service agreement with us. And uh, the, the entity that is signing that agreement is an unincorporated association in, in UK law, which is the form that's used for things like Cub Scout troops. Uh, and in the, to, to identify that unincorporated association, we name the individuals who are considered to be that association in the legal agreement. And we make clear in the legal agreement who is entitled to, to speak for that group of people on what topics. And then we only accept instructions from the named individual or individuals who are named in that agreement to, to take the tasks. So for Travel Spirit, there is one individual who has to agree, when it, no matter who asks to, to uh, uh, dispense an asset, that named individual has to be copied and has to agree, and they have made a commitment in our, uh, in our service agreement that they will consult the other named parties on the document. So we do it by explicitly naming an authoriser and by explicitly making that authoriser responsible for getting consensus from the other parties. U.S. law uh, comes from U.K. law, so we have a very similar uh, approach. We, we have a, an agreement and the template, <coughs> templates for, almost, for many of our agreements, we, we try to be as transparent as possible, so you can look on our website and uh, see an example of it. Um, uh, and we, we also name the individuals that come in, and the, the, part, the agreement establishes a governance procedure so that those were the initial people, and then the, there's like a, a, a more legal effectuating body that, uh, that transfers. But there's still this question that I think Pam is getting at, which is how do you know you have the right people, right? How do you know those original names are? And it was something that we struggled with a lot. And so uh, we belt and suspenders it. So what we do is we take the project, whoever approaches us at face value and, um, and explore the community, we read the mailing list, we check to make sure that the people who are, are talking to us are in fact involved with the, the project, but then we take it a step further and we, uh, we post messages on every possible place that we can think of that are like, author like authoritative places where these people are participating and say, this agreement is being signed, these are the people that are being identified. If you have any questions or object, Please review all this stuff. Please let us know. And so we're pretty, we're very confident in the end. And then similarly, we have a, a representative that is identified who can speak. And then we know the 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 committee or whatever governance body that will identify that new person going forward. Okay, one last question. Um, you uh, previously mentioned uh, the the issue about tax exception. Uh, do you think that uh, do you? provide or want to provide or don't provide at all some kind of tool to um, provide tax exception uh, in, uh, within uh, European countries uh, that would be a great tool to accelerate the um, involvement for business which uh, work uh, with open source, uh, make profit with open source, and tax exception uh, would be a great uh, great way to, to get involved, but uh, do it exist as, uh, in Italia, as Italian business may uh, donate some more to some, uh, some kind of association foundation and get uh, back some uh, exception. So we're, we're, we aren't aware of any mechanism that is devoted to, uh, to, to public software at the moment, and we've, we, we have, we've talked about setting up, for example, reciprocal arrangements where, you, uh, where somebody British could donate to public software and Moritz would then pay money out in Germany to the, uh, the, the, that was uh, and deduct tax. Um, there are actually already 
charitable organisations across Europe that do tax deductible exchanges across Europe, but they're typically set up for large donations. So the costs that are, with, for example, in the UK there is, uh, there is an organisation that handles charitable giving uh, on payrolls. So as a, if your company offers to make a charitable donation uh, on your behalf as a, as a salary deduction, they will then put the money into the, the hands of the charity that's involved. And the fees that they charge for that are scaled to the amount of money that they think they're going to be transferring, and they are beyond the means of, of most it's small donations for individuals. They are suitable for trusts that are making grants, but so it would be it would be feasible, for example, to, for Moritz to make a grant, a tax deductible grant, into the UK of uh, you know three thousand. Of 3,000 euros, but it wouldn't be feasible for me to pay my FSFE fellows fee in Germany because I, I tried. I actually tried doing it, and I found the fees that I got charged were actually more than the FSFE fellow fee. So I, I haven't done it again. Okay, I, I'm going to have to thank every, everyone very much for our panel. Thank our panelists, please.